Roly, you you went to Westminster and, and then up to Balliol to read to read what? So I, I read classics at university. Right. So the ancient Greek, Latin literature, philosophy, that kind of thing. So you left Oxford with a classics degree. Um, and almost immediately went into the BBC, presumably as a general trainee. Yes, I was a general trainee. Um, and the, the backstory there is that final year of university, I'd had that classic student's dilemma about what to do in life. And I, real, I had a moment of real honesty, which is, you know, what do I really love and care about and have always cared about growing up? And I'd grown up with broadcasting. I'd grown up with radio, with TV, this is the the world that had influenced my childhood, the national sense of humour, everything. And I simply and naively thought, is there a way to spend a life being involved with that? And I applied for a production traineeship at the BBC and was summarily rejected, probably quite rightly. Oh. But there was this other scheme called the general trainee scheme at the time that was a bit more open-ended. I think it was, in retrospect, maybe for people they couldn't quite figure out what to do with, but might have something to contribute. And in fact, there were four of us, I think, who were accepted onto the scheme that year, and we were the last. The, 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 that particular scheme was closed down oh, really? that year. So um, whether they took one look at us or... Anyway, who knows? But it was wonderful to get in that way because it was a, it was a blend of radio and TV. Um, whereas the production traineeships were all, I think, one medium or, or, or in news. So it was a two-year scheme, and it was a bit of radio to begin with, World Service, uh, Radio Ulster, where I worked a little bit in mm -hmm. um, arts programmes with Paul Muldoon, the poet, um, who was a producer, um, and a bit of Radio 4 arts programmes. I think I was probably even then drawn to the arts. Was and that then, the period of Kaleidoscope? And that was Kaleidoscope, yes. Yeah. So that was Kaleidoscope um, with um, Rosemary Hart as editor and amazing opportunities you get in radio because it's such an immediate medium. It's like what you set up for this interview now. Yeah. You can... I think it's doing as, as well as it's ever done, to be honest, at the moment. Certainly creatively and as a medium and actually with the growth of podcasts, absolutely. It's, mm. it's one, of, one of the great communications media ever invented of course yeah. and then came the switch to television and there were stints on Newsnight and on Everyman the religious documentary series but the cycle of attachments as they called them temporary placements uh, ended up in what was then the music and arts department of BBC television in Kensington House in Shepherd's Bush now a hotel it was just at a time of change in that uh, corner of the BBC and there was an outgoing department head and the corporation had decided to take a risk on appointing uh, an up-and-coming and quite celebrated producer called Alan Yentov to become head of department. So for a, a sort of 22-year-old coming in or 23-year-old coming into this mix uh, there was a real sense of a revolution in the air almost, of th doing things differently, of creative people being given a chance and of a, of, of a spirit in the air, really supportive of inventive filmmaking, creative filmmaking, passionate about the arts, um, quite competitive, um, uh, quite a culture proudly apart from... Uh, more conventional parts of the BBC. So you can imagine uh, that for a you know, young person coming in, incredibly interesting. And I um, found myself working with Nigel Williams, who was editing a, a literary programme called Bookmark at the time, which was a, a sort of magazine show about books and, and writers, and uh, began to make short films for him. And for me personally, that's been on and off a wonderful unbroken thread even to some of the work we're doing at the library uh, today. There was very much a Kensington House culture just as there was a Lime Grove uh, culture wasn't there? Uh, in fact Lime Grove I think was <laughs> under great suspicion from uh, from management as being a bit, a bit sort of lefty I suppose. 
Um, what was the Kensington House culture like? Well, I think there were a number of different cultures, of course, once you, did, you know, begin to look at the world this way, you can always find subcultures within subcultures. Yes. But I think, because of course there was a, a bar at Kensington House where Absolutely. all these different departments came together, but the, the corner I knew, of course, was music and arts, which I think felt that it was a, a space of difference and creativity uh, and to maybe more author, authored documentaries, documentaries made in a very uh, unusual way. So Arena was being run at that time by Nigel Finch and Anthony Wall. And generally that, that culture was quite strong. But it's interesting that you mention the Lime Grove culture, which of yeah. course historically was uh, entirely focused on current affairs and you know, panorama in the heyday. But I suppose I was a generation a little younger than... Alan and Leslie McGahey and that brilliant team of programme makers. And I was given great opportunities. And I remember Leslie gave me the chance to make an omnibus when I was very young on the History of Ealing Studios and learned a great deal. I did some long form documentaries with Nigel Williams. But there was, the, by the late 80s, there was a fresh spirit in the air, a, a brisk kind of, more, you know, different kind of magazine programme making, first with a uh, programme called Saturday Review that John Archer edited. Um, and then Michael Jackson joined the department, brought in by Alan Yentop. Uh, and Michael, of course, was a successful young independent producer. So Michael's background was he was part of the, the campaigning group that had actually led to the creation of Channel 4. And then he'd run his, his own business successfully for a yes. while. And Alan really brought him in, I think, to creatively refresh what even then was, you know, by that point you know Alan had probably been around the department for 15 years or so so it was a time to uh, for those of us who were in our 20s and sort of early 30s it was a chance to actually begin to make our own culture within the culture and under Alan's um, uh, sort of sponsorship I think by then as head of BBC2 controller of BBC2 a group of us set up the late show which mm -hmm. Michael Jackson was the the editor of and that was based at Lime Grove you know, the team for that came together in about 1988. And Michael pieced together a team of producers, directors, researchers, presenters, which proudly and defiantly blended a little bit of BBC culture, a little bit of Kensington House, mm -hmm. but bringing that together with people from the youth programming movement coming out of London Weekend Television, uh, more independent journalists and filmmakers, interesting thinkers and, and writers, presenters ranging from Tracy McLeod to Michael Ignatieff to Sarah Dean Ant. Yeah. And that really was a moment where I think a group of us felt something, even after that, that, that revolution that, that, that Arena and other programmes had delivered in the department. The Late Show added something else again because it was nightly, it was live, it yes. was in Lime Grove, which, uh, yes. as anyone who worked there knows, is a very particular kind of out-on-a-limb <laughs> space. It's ramshackle. You have to go up five fire escapes just yes. to get from an office oh, to it was a, a wonderful place. I studio. Uh, everything was always rather nervous and against the clock. But these are perfect conditions for good creative work. You'd had late night lineup though from television centre from Pres A, Pres B, and so on. Uh, so, how much was this? How was this different? Well, this was uh, w when we were setting up the Late Show. We all sat and watched old recordings of late night lineup, and don't forget, by the late eighties, late night lineup was heritage. That was ancient history. That had, you know, Joan Bakewell had gone on air with that when I was seven or something. So. <laughs> Uh, that was both quirky but inspiring because we recognised in that programme a group of young producers making their own way and doing their own things and actually using a late night slot to do things differently. And we were doing that but in a full scale studio and with some resources to make films. So there was a, some of that Kensington House tradition of creative filmmaking was in the blend. Uh, Michael brought a keen, almost magazine editor's sense of topicality, quite intellectual, quite questioning, always looking for the angle, 
never just indulging arts for art's sake, but mm -hmm. always trying to tell stories. It was a media program as well as an arts program. So, so a lot of reviews. Well, it, it, it was a, quite rarely just a review. We did you usually did a review slot once a week. But generally, we were trying to do pieces that were commentary or journalistic yep. Yep. or had an angle or typically where there was a blend where culture met politics or ideas. Yes. And I'm afraid, yes. again, unbroken thread, sadly, to today, but yeah. the weekend that we went on air was when there was the first major controversy leading to a book burning in Bradford of Salman Rushdie's um, book, The Satanic Verses. Yes. And we changed the running order that night and interviewed. In fact, I think Salman was due to be on, so we interviewed him. Uh, about what was happening within a few weeks. We'd have to check the timeline. The fatwa had been issued. And then for us in particular, coming after Newsnight, running a programme that talked about the intersection of arts, culture, creativity and politics, that was a story which we continued to, to look at and Very consider. Yeah. And of course, then by the... We went on air at the beginning of January 89. By the end of the year... The Berlin Wall was falling and we did our own take on that and we sent teams over and were trying to tell stories of, of what the cultural story was around the fall of the Soviet Empire. Yes. Come the Velvet Revolution, I mm -hmm. remember, we did quick, a quick turnaround piece. Paul Pavlikovsky, Pavel Pavlikovsky, who knew Václav Havel from his days on Bookmark, went off for the late show and... And he'd had plays yeah. put on. He had plays put on in in the Richmond. That's right. Yes, exactly. yeah. mm. But there, you had a playwright mm. who was suddenly becoming president. Yes, uh, um, extraordinary. Yes. So, it was when we talk about the spirit or of the moment. It it was a, a never to be replicated time because it was a particular coming together of a particular format, as ever with the best kinds of TV creativity. A certain amount of permission given to a group of. of a creative team to do yeah. good work, and then history happening in, in front of our eyes, all produced out of Lime Grove. <laughs> yes. Now, that's interesting. I didn't realise it had come from Lime Grove. What to be fair, it did flip to Television Centre about after the first two years it, yes. it moved to TV Centre. But it sounds more collegiate than, than, say, the time of Hugh Weldon, where it was very patrician, and you think Hugh Weldon, and you also think, uh, well, you think Monitor, you think um, Civilization and so on. These were ideas that were coming from a group of people with sort of shared cultural backgrounds and shared cultural interests. Shared interests. I mean, I think to give credit to Michael, he made sure to have a range of different backgrounds, uh, you know, in terms of experience, regionality, you know, different educational backgrounds. It was it was a mix, which is not to say there wasn't out of that a, late, a distinctive late show voice, which is probably quite easy to parody then mm. and, and now. Yes. Um, but one of the shared, widely shared enthusiasms was a fascination with the history of television itself. And I've talked about that as one of the, my motivations for wanting to, to try and get involved in this industry at all was that sense of having grown up with it. And I think that was true around that office and those corridors. And quite a lot of the pieces that we did were creative uses of the television archive often to tell a particular story. But I think there was a whole strand where we were playing with the archive. Caroline Wright was specialised in that area, was a brilliant, was and is a brilliant archive producer. Yes, yes. a good archivist is uh, very valuable. No, it's music and arts. What about music? Well, music was, I mean, I was never a music specialist, but the, but the Late Show was a music programme, among other things, and we would always have, once or twice a week at least, live music in the show. Typically up-and-coming bands. Yes. Occasionally very famous, well-established bands. Moments of television history include the famous night the Stone Roses were live in the studio, and at the very last minute... Uh, before they began their performance, turned up all the uh, levels on their amplifiers and blew the sound system so that after uh, a few bars, the whole thing went quiet. 
and this is all recorded live on television and poor Tracy <laughs> McLeod had to yes. uh, uh, step up and apologise while they were yes. swearing behind Turned it up to 11 on the... Uh, pr- yeah, I'm not sure if it was 11, but... Yes, there so music was, uh, certainly for The Late Show, and of course, by the way, yes, in, in the arts department, more music and arts department more generally, massive resources and talent under Dennis Marks and Peter Manure and others yes. in maintaining the classical music. Oh, Peter was there by then, wasn't he? He yeah. was, yes. No, Peter and I are, are close contemporaries. So in maintaining the, the classical music, proms, opera and so on. But on The Late Show, it was generally a bit more rock and roll. Yeah. That, of course, led to a late night experiment. By then, the music producer was Mark Cooper. Mm-hmm. And with Michael's blessing, Mark held on to the studio after the main late show had finished and copied or, or was inspired by an early 1960s American format where you get different bands into different corners of the studio and they play to each other. And it was a bit later, by definition, than the late show, so we called it later. And the presenter was then, was Jules Holland. Ah, later with Jules. Uh, yes. And that was the, the birth of later with Jules. I see. As an offshoot of the late show. Who knew that has turned out to be the bit of The Late Show that has continued to this day. Yes. In fact, I was just the other day at the recording in Alexandra Palace of the edition of Later with Jewels that went out on the exact 30th anniversary of the first ever show. Now, th- th- what interests me is that the commissioning, the ideas, was very much internal in those days. You didn't have this idea of a commissioning editor who looked outside. Yes, that that period, late 80s, early 90s, you already, of course, had Channel 4 by then, uh, providing a creative spur to the BBC Mm -hmm. by being different already. And that was undoubtedly part of the the challenge that led, I think, to Alan's version of BBC Two and the experiments of which The Late Show was one, to show that the BBC could, could respond to the, just the sheer diversity of voice that, that Channel 4 was, was bringing in. Yeah. But of course, underlying that was not just, if you like, creative policy, but a certain amount of industrial policy to actually begin to break the monopoly power of BBC and ITV, not just in terms of the kinds of stories being told, but who was making the programme. And over time, and, and I can't remember at what point the... 25% quota for mm. independent production came in to yeah. the BBC. But certainly by the time... Well, that was with Bert, wasn't it? I it was. Mrs Thatcher, um, I thought. Had, uh, uh, I think it... Yeah, as I say, I can't remember. No. I, I suspect it was a, 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 an 80s era intervention. But by the time I'd moved on from The Late Show, but was continuing to make programmes as an executive in the music and arts department, you were beginning to get quite proper generally pretty healthy competition from a nascent independent sector. And I guess you then had probably at least a 15-year period of transition where the in-house production departments of BBC Television, having been an effective monopoly supplier to the channels, began to have to act in a slightly more transactional way and you began to get a commissioning round where the channels were reviewing independent proposals alongside in-house proposals and the in-house program making teams were still powerful forces in the culture and the organization but there was a mostly healthy but sometimes difficult creative tension in the air well eventually of course you had a series of formal splits that occurred in the organisation. This was under John Burt's mm, uh, yes, of course. Uh, aegis. Initially, if you remember, there was producer choice, so empowering producers yes. to commission or choose their own uh, resources, suppliers, filmmakers, you know, camera teams, editing facilities. Yes. And then exactly the same, if you like, was then done to the production. Controller ABC, choice. With the split between broadcast and production. Yeah. And you had effectively controller choice, and that was probably mid nineties. I think we'd have to check the exact date. Mm-hmm. And that was when you began to get the formalising of commissioning as, if 
you like, the central act of editorial choice in, in much of television, not all of television, because obviously current affairs and news has remained mm-hmm. and remain very integrated, but for everything around documentary making, um, entertainment, comedy, features, really from that broadcast production split onwards, you had the, the emergence of the model you have to this yeah. day, which is a commissioning level not dissimilar to what Channel 4 had been incubating mm. as, a, as a commissioning only public broadcaster since the early 80s. And then, of course, just to complete that narrative before I then go back into my yeah. personal history, over time that led to an increasing set of challenges and contradictions with running those in house production teams because they only had one customer. Uh, which was the BBC, which meant that their income stream year on year was very unpredictable because they could do nothing to manage it, manage the ups and downs, because the programmes they were making were entirely determined by another part of the BBC. So in that sense, in in spite of their sort of cultural power in the organisation, they had lost, they didn't have the freedom of manoeuvre. Lost a lot of spontaneity, presumably. Well, uh, there was an element of that, and we can come back to that, Mm. but simply in terms of production departments trying to just run a public service business, Mm -hmm. uh, it was extremely difficult to do, whereas their now competitors in the independent sector didn't have the stability of a big public organisation, but also did have the ability to be commissioned by Channel 4 or ITV and, and so on. And so in the long run, that is the historic shift that led in the end to the movement of most of in-house BBC production into the commercial side of the operation under what is now BBC Studios, Studios, where they do have the ability to pitch and be commissioned by other broadcasters, both in the UK and globally. And that's coincided with a time of massive global investment in television. So really, in my lifetime, we've seen a shift at the BBC, not to stop being a producer, which is the thing that probably concerned me most at the BBC, because I think it's very healthy for the BBC to be making some or a lot of its own programmes, but it now does it on a large-scale model that is more like a large independent producer. And it's really had to reinvent itself completely, and of course there is now no department like a music and arts department within that. Do you think that's uh, they've lost a lot because of that? I think they've gained and lost. Yes. And that's just the, the, the creative. But I think they've been smart to navigate their way into a way of being able to still proudly make programmes with the BBC brand yes. on them. Because at one point, if, you'd, if simply all that had happened had been an erosion of anything, any production under the BBC banner, that would have been the true hollowing out of the BBC to yeah. make it literally yeah. just yes. another commissioning team. Sure. So, no, but I mean, obviously, some of what can get lost is, is a, as it were, that spontaneity. You can, though, I mean, some of the spontaneity I've been describing was taking place at programme team level around, you know, particular programme, let, let, you know, use the late show as an example. Within a and, strand, and, and, and I mean, you can, Within a strand yeah. or something. Mm-hmm. And you can still do that in, you know, some of the best television independently produced or in-house produced can still, can still be those but there's breeding grounds for ideas and there's fostering you know, spaces where you can foster creativity. So yeah. I think I, I'm not particularly golden ageist about it. There, was, there were brilliant things there. Yes. And there should be ways to, to, um, to do different versions of that today. But certainly, undoubtedly gone is that very solid, uh, sort of wholly integrated genre base. Yes. Uh, Yes. production house yes. model that, that, that we had. Elitist, of course, is one of the words. Populist, of course, is another. In a sense, the BBC is sort of yeah, well, navigating right. away between the two, isn't it? Or is it? Well, the great thing about the BBC is that it, it, it at its best, ignores language like that and just gets on with, with, with serving everybody with great programmes. Yeah. And that's yeah. 
<laughs> what, what we were trying to do, even if the actual audiences for the Late Show were, were relatively <laughs> modest some nights, but <laughs> yes. but nonetheless, you know, we, we wanted anybody and everybody to to tune in. I remember, yes, yes. Uh, Anthony Wall once being asked, "Who is your target audience for Arena?" and he said, uh, "Absolutely everybody sitting in the front room, turning to each other and saying shush and just concentrating," <laughs> which is utopian. Yes, 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 TV. yes, yes. But 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 carries a. a a spark of truth in it, which is why free to air broadcasting and real broadcasting that that has is underpinned by a sense of the passing day and the moment and the news hour and, and the, yes. so on remains a very potent force. The schedule is important. And the schedule and, is and important. Should it's stay not, so. It's it? it's not um statistically it can't be uh bang at the centre of the culture or won't be. No, but you relate because, things to the schedule, don't but you? But you can... But you, you, can, you go in you and out on both. iClayer and or whatever. Mm. It, for, if you want... If, if Netflix or Amazon or others would like to have real cultural salience as opposed to just commercial success, and even the latter is mm. vulnerable, um, they would want to have a regular news broadcast and, and be able... To comfortably, even on today's overnight figures, to reach three or four million people at, at prime time, it's yeah. a very, very powerful force. Yes. Um, but we're straying into another conversation because undoubtedly, um, the long predicted tipping points are beginning to be on us now, and for people under the age of, of thirty. Yes, trying to attract the youth. You, you certainly won't get yeah. mass audiences in quite no. that way. For I that mean, kind of children, audience. you know. My grandchildren, they don't know what the BBC is. Uh, I don't know whether they listen to it. I don't think they do. They're on their games machines all the time. But, um, I mean, there is a, vir- a real challenge for the BBC now, which is how I mean, to I, capture yeah. the, the well, younger, I mean, to, the younger to audience. Well, I mean, to flash forward a little bit yeah. into, the, in, to the biographical version of this, I mean, around the time of that broadcast production split, I'd begun to become very interested in the digital, the first tremors of the digital revolution yeah. that I guess you're, you and I are now talking about. Yes. Uh, I think I'd been, for some reason, I have no idea why, I'd been to see a lecture about digital compression in broadcasting, and I didn't understand any of it, yes. except the one bit where the, the, the person talking said that very, very soon now, you will be able to broadcast eight channels in the spectrum that yes, currently yes. is required for one. Yeah. And that was a massive penny dropping for me because I began, just the creative juices started to flow and I mm. began to see, well, actually, if we're no longer constrained by having quite so few channels, maybe we could be doing more. And I began to to start pitching ideas for new channels, maybe whole dedicated channels devoted to the arts and whatever it might be. Those thoughts arrived just at the time that the BBC at corporate level, was beginning to develop its own strategy for the multi-channel and before too long digital channel revolution. Because so you went to UK did. TV for a and while. And that's what led to the creation of, of, of UK TV. Right. So uh, a group of us got co-opted in. So I was coming from the public service side, partnered with friends from, from BBC Worldwide, was involved in the the great commercial pitch to go out to the market to find a partner and mm-hmm. famously I think Sky thought or hoped they might become the BBC's partner and in the end it was the cable company Flextech to everyone's oh, surprise yes, and so yes uh, by the second half of the 90s I'd find myself having moved from the world of arts program making to actually setting up a, a, a channel programming team for a suite of commercial advertising funded channels joint venture, 50-50 joint venture, uh, kept my BBC, I and my team kept our BBC staff passes, but we were cohabiting with um, friends uh, uh, from Flextech who were running the ad sales team and the marketing teams. I learnt more about television in that year in many ways than I ever had before or since because suddenly I was pitching to ad sales teams and I was understanding a little bit or trying to understand the dynamics of the coming revolution yes. of the of the of the multi-channel revolution that had already begun 
and the incipient digital channel revolution that, yes. that, that lay just behind it. Because and a lot of technologies were, were advancing at a, at a similar time, enabling more and more to be done. It, absolutely. So, I mean, around that time, I remember visiting some of the pioneering teams somewhere just off Shepherd's Bush Green, who were experimenting with this thing called the World Wide Web. And I remember mm. one of them, I can't remember who it was, saying to me, listen to this, listen to this. They, it was like a, almost like a wireless set, but they tuned in over the internet to a live radio broadcast yes. from the West Coast yes. of America. And that was another penny drop moment where you realise actually the internet was going to be the carrier for broadcasting. Yes, because eventually. up to this point, you were trying to squeeze quartz into pint pots on the, the terrestrial transmissions. Yes, so there were two, I suppose, at least two parallel revolutions going. There was, first of all, cable and satellite had opened up a bit more spectrum for linear broadcasting. Then digital compression was turning that into massively greater scope for linear. Mm. And at the margins of that, you were also beginning to see so-called interactive TV yep. product developments going on. And then, of course, alongside all of that and in tandem was the Internet and World Wide Web coming up on the inside and, and the BBC really overtaking others by understanding the power of that, particularly initially for news, web content provision, BBC News, and then before too long, of course, for other things that became BBC Online and ultimately yes. Yes. So entirely personally, I'd you know done that stint where we'd created UK TV and, and, and remained very, very proud of that because people said the BBC was a lumbering beast and couldn't do joint ventures and didn't understand the commercial mm. world. And the principles we set up then lasted as a hugely successful joint venture very difficult very always very hard to manage those partnerships but commercially and creatively very successful and now in the guise of dave and yesterday and others it's now wholly owned by the bbc and continues to be one of probably the largest portion of the bbc's uk commercial income over and above the license fee so that was as i say a great learning experience and a, and a great sort of creative launch. And then after a couple of years, I found myself back in public service BBC. Well, initially trying to make sense yes. of, of the digital channels that were already nascent. Yes. And I was thinking then, by the way, of, of the observation that children don't encounter the BBC. But mm. hopefully some of the interventions made around that time remedy that a bit because this was the era of launching CBBS and uh, CBBS in particular, but CBBC as well as, as standalone channels. We had very embryonic linear channels called BBC Choice and BBC Knowledge. Oh, yes, Knowledge. I remember Choice, it which eventually became BBC Four. Me, yes, I mean, yeah. I sort of, with David Doherty, under his strategic supervision, led and Mark Thompson's push to relaunch, rebrand, recreate Choice and Knowledge as BBC Three and BBC Four. Yep. And so, yes, the sequence of events was that I created the concept for BBC Four and became launch controller. We tried to get BBC Three off the ground at the same time, but mm. if you remember, the government didn't like the initial pitch. And so that came a year or so later, Stuart Murphy as, as controller. Yeah. So we launched BBC Four in, I think, 2002. And that led, yes, to in, in, in a little while, once uh, with Jaina Bennett, by then as head of television, director of television, I took over as controller of BBC Two and ran that yes. for the next sort of four and a half years. We must just to have a little tiny side thing about Jerry Springer, because mm -hmm. that was an extraordinary, well, an interesting thing about what the BBC can a get either get away with or feel it should be doing or whatever it is. Do you want to set the scene for that? Yes, tell us a bit about I mean, it. I'll do a brief version yeah, of yeah, it. I mean, it's, it's, one, yes. uh, yeah. I mean, I suppose it's again, it's about the spirit of experimentation and creativity mm -hmm. and some threads going right back to the music and arts department, and in this instance, back to the classical music team, and Peter Manura, who was always looking for creative ways to both capture performance and also represent the creative edge of what was happening in musical, you know, serious musical theatre or, mm -hmm. or, or opera. And Jerry Springer, the opera, of course, was a complete standalone cultural yes. event but but brilliant in its way and and with the remarkable you know 
Stuart Lee as the presiding uh, author of it all. So it, it was Peter's team who produced the broadcast. And obviously, we knew it was, was going to be a, a, a bold and uh, a piece of television broadcasting. But we were very clear that it was a great piece of British creativity and it, it, had, it was superbly executed and had serious things to say, as well as being entertaining and uh, outrageous and groundbreaking. The, the Daily Telegraph produced a very good article comparing it with Life of Brian and all these things and saying it was no more blasphemous than that and the, 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 the and, language, fair enough. And yes, and obviously the language, certainly the, the number of swear words being yes. signed off for compliance <laughs> was high. We knew that. Right, yes. But if you'll forgive me, I won't do the, the, the long version of the no. story here. But of course, it, it triggered a mass email campaign that then triggered threatening phone calls, that triggered addresses being published. Oh, really? Um, and that's really what gave it its very particular temperature at the time. So it wasn't just lots of complaints. It was a sense of an internet campaign turning into a moment of potential personal threat. For yes, threat to freedom of choice. And very much looking forward to what's happening now. Definitely. I mean, certainly... We know that some of the the, the, the the sort of generated emails were coming from across the Atlantic and so on. So were they? some yeah. of that sense of the internet massively increasing the ability to amplify campaigns, that was an early precursor of it, long before social media. Yes. Of course, I think the world is different now, and we're very, very alive uh, to all of that. But the programme was broadcast... Of course, quite understandably and properly, there you know it was tested through Ofcom and complaints were rejected through Ofcom. There were tests again in terms of what the blasphemy law might or might not mean, and it's a, it is a bit of a point of pride that that actually case law now is that that law does not cannot apply to broadcasting. That was the the ruling. So without intending to, it changed the landscape. It was all around the time of charter renewal, and of course you begin to think. Do incidents like that damage the BBC or public broadcasting or do they, by to some extent demonstrating where the space could be, help to demonstrate why it's important and can take risks from time to time? So those are some reflections on it. You were actually part of the uh, the BBC team negotiating the, the licence fee, weren't you? Not quite the licence fee, but I was actually just before that time, sort of later BBC4, yes, for about six or eight months, I was um, co-opted with Charles Constable from Greg Dyke's team. And we were we were teamed up and we led the, the charter renewal charter process. Renewal. And um, that was a very interesting period where we helped to reshape the language of public purpose around the library of public value. It's what led to the building public value charter renewal document that... Um, uh, this work was sponsored by Carolyn Fairbairn and Caroline Thompson. And, I mean, I think we hope it was quite influential. I mean, some of the work, the theory around public value, which was an attempt to shift the debate around institutions like the BBC away from being merely about market failure or remediating what the market can't do to something more proactive and declaring mm-hmm. actually there are certain kinds of value creation you can do with broadcasting that are about culture, about citizenship, about education. And it's not just that the market won't quite deliver it, the the market can't get close to delivering the full value of that. Right. That theory is something which is now animating a lot of discussions. I bet it is. Involved with with the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose Mm. down the road at UCL which is building quite a, a lot of theory inspired by some of the BBC, uh, BBC's own activities, demonstrating the power of what state-backed innovation can do, both to innovate for society as a whole and actually create the conditions for commercial companies to then accelerate their own innovation. Often what the public space can do is prove concept, push boundaries, test ideas, try things out, And I think, by the way, historically, a good illustration of that, that one of the first, if not the first, really impactful television streaming platforms was the BBC iPlayer. And it then fell to Amazon and Netflix and others 
to build on that commercially yeah. to build their own models with massive it's a fantastic piece investments. of software actually so um it was indeed yeah. <laughs> and is indeed and um and that is an instance where i think there is a thread in everything we're talking about of the power of a strong institution that can maintain the political um, consensus for it to flourish to then innovate on behalf of, of both its host nation yes. but also the industry it's part of and of course then provoke inspire other kinds of other kinds of innovation yes so that's this is grandiose stuff I mean, talking about but i mean it was definitely there back in that charter renewal i think it's been a thread in other yeah. charter renewal work that the bbc has done and i who knows what will come next but mm. i mean you have to hope given the the for all the always difficulties you know, for all the, the even the strength and visibility of current bbc that these arguments are being thought about and talked about in, in yes. the corridors of power now because it merges um schedules television with on-demand television doesn't it and yes and, and radio of course well um, and, and that i mean i know you wanted to talk a little bit about some of the archive oh absolutely we, yeah, we sure. did i mean yeah. that was really this thread i suppose in a personal way i've always as you can probably tell done i wouldn't call it a zigzag but i've ended up more or less alternating with i used to say with jobs that do exist and jobs that should exist at the bbc <laughs> and so i did one more job that does exist which i was briefly controller of bbc one as well yes. as bbc two how different was Peter that Pitchin. as a matter of interest <laughs> well it is a different it's a different shape of channel because everything it does speaks louder it does fewer different things in other words the building blocks are in place bbc two is a you know intricate quite an intricate patchwork quilt of a channel not many many more individual short run commissions and interesting things and one-offs as we were just t discussing mm -hmm. whereas bbc one tends to deal in bigger bets bigger pieces uh and you've got a lot of fixed points like east and, so and, uh, and of course it's the home of most of the big drama most of the big uh, entertainment i think i did the two together for seven or eight months and uh uh, amazing privilege mm. uh, uh, and actually running the two together which of course is what then became a model that I think has really been incubated continued to be deployed under Charlotte's tenure at the moment has I think great strengths because it meant maybe come Christmas scheduling you could deploy pieces in a more fluid mm. way and actually say, oh that feels more like a BBC two piece that could could go to uh, to BBC one so it was uh, terrific to have both channels side by side and be able to um, see how that you know that total jigsaw of the two big channels fitted together how did you think that bbc4 would fit in with what traditionally bbc2 did because bbc2 was amongst other things the arts channel and so on wasn't it and i think it well i mean that goes back to that principle of do of digital allowing you to do more um, mm -hmm. and i think bbc2 really if it ever was an arts channel uh it was by default the the home of, of most or many of the arts programs mm. in its early early years but i think some of the logic that led to the creation of those digital channels bbc3 bbc4 was actually to identify important things for the health of the bbc ecology that BBC Two just couldn't do at scale by itself because it had so many other jobs to do in complementing BBC One and its many, many mm -hmm. fixed points. And one of them is programming for the young, for sure. And uh, uh, it used to have Deaf Two, if you remember, and a few other slots for younger audiences. But the, the strong and emerging feeling was you needed a channel that, that would be at the margins of the schedule. And similarly, by the mid 90s, to be honest, a lot of arts programs were at the margins of the schedule and the power of BBC Four is you could create a place where actually you could schedule a whole evening's worth of content. Some, quite a lot of archive, by the way, and, yep. and I'm not dismayed actually by a more archive based version of BBC Four because it can do a great deal with that, but with some origination mm -hmm. as well. Because uh, it seems it to be a performance and archive channel now, effectively. Is, is that yes, wrong? Well, it, it's, uh, it's definitely reduced in terms of, but, uh, of its commissioning ability to commission. Mm. But if you go back to BBC Four Mark One, it had a very, very slender commissioning budget, and it did have, you know, we were absolutely committed to serious deployment of archive and uh, and performances yeah. as well. 
it certainly at in the context of BBC Two as it then was, it provided, both channels provided a powerful sense of difference to what was then quite properly, competitively, quite a mainstream mm. uh, BBC Two. Now, time passes and the landscape of linear channels and digital provision and on demand and, and broadcast shifts. So I wouldn't want to predict what the correct shape of a channel portfolio no. in the future should be. I mean, the future Although of the BBC the, is quite daunting, moment. though, isn't it? For oh, David, it's always been daunting. It's always been daunting. Well, <laughs> well it's more it daunting. Really, no, it's not more daunting. Honestly, it's not more daunting. I, when I, seriously. Well, seriously, I mean, I, yeah. when I tried to kind of get my head around the BBC's challenges when I was yeah. wondering if I might apply for a job there, mm. I was reading... Uh, uh, apocalyptic descriptions of how the license fee had a maximum of five years to run. Right. The cable revolution was going to kill off everything we knew as public service broadcasting. The BBC mm. was doomed. The political climate was hostile. Yes. So, uh, so really. So what's new there? Quite. Uh, yes, exactly. If anything, yes. I'd say the opposite. I'd think then those very deterministic views of technology, and you heard them again at the turn of the century around. The internet yes. um, had great currency. I think now there's a little less pure determinism in the air and a greater, what you might call, lived experience of how great public broadcasting institutions can duck and weave and survive and reinvent themselves. And that needs to happen. So it's never easy. I'm not saying no. it's easier now than it was in the 80s. I'm no. not convinced it's harder either. No, so, I, just, I, just, um, I just worry that the that because of all the distractions, online distractions, that it is much more difficult now to attract a, th a 20s and 30s audience. Oh, that's certainly true. Yeah. That's certainly and true. What, yeah. How do you, and, and what yeah. do you do about that? You know, if you're, if you're trying to think of the future of the BBC, because unless it does attract that audience, it's failing to do what it normally does, which is reach everyone. Yeah. Let's let's move to archive then, well, because I, your your I, I whole was, business on archive. I was only going was to say that I mean I yes. think yes we I mean and the the work we did around the archive in those years, the late two thousands early, mm. was a natural evolution of all of those digital strands we've been talking about, because it was based on exactly the insight that you see that underpins Netflix mm -hmm. and. Uh, all four and other uh, platforms which is that actually if you are going to rethink and reimagine public broadcasting fully into the middle of this century it needs to have a presence on the internet that is more than just catch up broadcasting from last night's linear yeah. schedule it's the back catalog you will never want yeah. Uh, in my view, to give up, you were saying earlier, mm. the, 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 the inherited cultural meaning of there still being scheduled broadcasting yeah. is something that uh, you know, I think has great durability, though its actual scale of consumption is clearly destined yes, yes. To, to shrink. But so do many great cultural inventions. That doesn't mean they disappear. It means they take their place in the culture. Well, it provides but a, a map, long... a temporal map yes, for, the, temporal map, for the audience. That's, that's yes. very nicely put. But I, I think alongside that, to future-proof, you need to start building a presence. And of course, iPlayer is ultimately, or whatever succeeds iPlayer, yeah. has to be the vehicle for this, the, you know, the version of the BBC that is completely attuned to an internet-based um, universe simply yep. because so many consumers will be only consuming their television via the internet. And it was the beginning of a piece of thinking which was moving away from iPlayer as it then was as a seven-day catch-up service. So the content on iPlayer was entirely predicated by whatever we channel controllers had scheduled, and it disappeared after seven days. And yeah. we felt very lucky to have seven days, and that, that in itself was a superb piece of negotiation by the BBC's commercial affairs team with all the rights mm -hmm. holders. And yes, so yes, yes. But it was still only seven days. What you've seen since then, of course, is the advent of products like Netflix, 
which have countless thousands of hours of content, which are underpinned underneath all their big new commissions, are underpinned by the sense of a universe of content that once you've got people in, there will always be something for them. That's, I suppose, the promise. And what we called the archive work at the BBC was about beginning to reinvent the BBC's online presence to be as scaled up to reflect that, that the back catalogue, by the way, by that we didn't necessarily mean especially the very old back catalogue, although that's very important for research purposes and and, and heritage and nostalgia purposes and as comedy, of course, is indelible and so on, but about the what you might call the future archive of the BBC to begin to shift the idea of commissioning so that when you commission something, it's not just a piece of content that will bloom briefly overnight, but might actually still have longevity and be enjoyed. And for commercial services, of course, that makes sense because you mm-hmm. can continue to monetize. Yes, of course. And the BBC has a commercial identity and needs some mm-hmm. of that. But also for its cultural presence and salience, it gives it a heft and a weight and a meaning that it's not just a broadcaster, yes. but that it is actually this repository of memory and meaning. Yeah. And really what you're beginning to see now, and I mean, by the way, Channel 4 does it with, with, with all four, but BBC now is you can see that iPlayer now is already a rich archival sure. service and does have that sense that if you are that specialist audience, you should hopefully be able to find, even, even if it's not been scheduled recently, you can find remarkable arts content yes. or music content, whatever it might be there. But the elephant in the room is rights. And I think there was a point at which you were beginning to think the archive could be divided into uh, material which was, you know, just could be freely given to everybody, to material which was high end and you could charge for people to look at it. Is that right? Um, everything, you have to think holistically, of course, um, always. So, all the work then and ever since, I think, at the BBC has been about looking at all of this in the round and trying to understand how you, for the licence fee, deliver the richest possible free service to citizens, online, linear, on demand and so on, while also getting terrific value for money where you can and rewarding rights holders reasonably for the work they do. That was always in the air in the thinking around UK TV, which was at the monetizing end, but monetizing always with quality and purpose yes. and new origination. And I think that's where, again, you'd have to talk to current BBC. Yes, yes, uh, it's folks, unfair to ask you. But I, that's what yeah. I'm, they are exactly where I think we all hoped they would get to, which is a much richer, free public service archival offer on, um, on BBC iPlayer. But with the ability to switch content out or license commercially overseas, so you'll see wonderful shows for free on iPlayer if you're in the UK, also available through commercial platforms. Into So all those, those diagrams we were doing back then weren't about binary divisions. They were about different spaces in which content could sometimes coexist mm-hmm. nationally, internationally, yeah. free or pay. What I think the BBC successfully achieved, though I'm sure it can go further, is creating different spaces where programmes can live, but where quite properly they worked to make the free public space ever richer. And uh, mm-hmm. that's what I think You know, the, the current version of iPlayer looks to me like it is delivering can you just say something very briefly though about genome because you you get you got that going the spine of the bbc's existence yes say something about that i've forgotten about that uh well no (laughs) but although i was (laughs) using it the other day just to to check something out well uh, uh, um that uh, all around that time we were uh, um uh building these new strategies we we were looking at um all the other resources the BBC had built up and what's the right thing uh, to do with them in the internet age. And one of those resources, of course, was what my librarian friends would call the metadata, or the, but the, uh, the the factual history of the schedules and the, of the programmes. And the insight there was that at least up until 
a certain date, whenever that was, 2010 or so, that history was contained in the record of the Radio Times, which had not been digitised fully at that point. And this was, I think, around the time that the business model for Radio Times was changing and the ownership was potentially changing. Yes. So we just set up quite a modest project to ensure that all those records were digitised. They were declared to be great pieces of public domain information literally data that had been paid for by the licensed yeah. fee payers over the years and that that should be tidied up cleaned up made available made searchable it's rough and ready some of it you know some programs had massive radio times listings some of yes, them were pretty yes, yes. slender so I think those who use Genome have to get used to its many, many quirks. But it now has archive but, material attached to it. Good or ill, exactly. Yes. No, we knew it would become a spine mm. that if you use the web wisely, you can then add other layers mm. to. So it was, uh, I think, a, a, a great project, great. nicely delivered. Yeah, absolutely. And now... Um, as, as internet friends say, scaling nicely. Yeah. Anyway, let's just finish yeah, on that. Nice yes. Let's just say, um, Rowley, it's a fascinating discourse on the, on on your on your BBC career. But I mean, I've enjoyed this very much, and thank uh, you very much for doing it. Pleasure. Well, I, I hope it's been useful, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Excellent. Bye bye.